first of the International Gaming Standards Association live webinars. Uh, my name is Mark Bass and I'm the Managing Director of GSA Europe. Uh, these webinars are based on the topics that we've covered in the Conversations YouTube video series. Uh, you can access those Conversations videos by clicking on the YouTube logo and you'll find that at the bottom right of the main igsa.org uh, page. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking our inaugural panelists um, for taking the time to participate. Uh, I'm sure uh, that you will find the session to be both fun and informative. Uh, a few housekeeping things before we get started um, for the attendees. If you have a question, uh, please click on the Q&A button, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, then just type your question in. If you wish to ask a question of a specific um, panelist, then please identify that person in your question. Uh, we have GSA staff that is standing by and they are looking at the questions. Uh, they're going to be uh, grouping them by topic and then uh, we'll, we'll go through them uh, at the end to, in the Q&A uh, section of this uh, webinar. Uh, also, please note this webinar is being recorded uh, and will be available for viewing on the igsa.org website. Again, you find it by clicking on the YouTube icon off of the, uh, the main page. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, GSA is really grateful to these panelists who have so very generously agreed to share their gaming industry and GSA standards experience. Uh, I'll ask each of them to give a short bio uh, of themselves after I introduce them. So with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists uh, and sort of going in alphabetical order uh, from the Alberta Gaming Lottery Corporation, we have Mr. Greg Bennett who's the Senior Manager, Technical Products and Compliance. Greg? Yeah, I've been uh, working with uh, the GSA and the G2S standard for about 10 years. Um, it's one of the things that we pushed through because we have about a 1,000 sites uh, and uh, quite a large area to cover. And it made sense to go with the GSA protocol. Great, thank you. Uh, from the Atlantic Lottery Corporation, we have Mr. Paul Burns, who's the Senior Managing Strategy and Marketing, and also uh, is a GSA board member. Paul, hello. Hi, Mark. Yeah, um, I've been in the lottery gaming industry for over 35 years now and uh, have been involved in our video lottery program since its inception in 1990. Uh, we were one of the first jurisdictions in North America to implement video lottery. Over that time, um, I've been involved from a field service management perspective, uh, product development, uh, marketing, and then since the implementation of uh, G2S, also onboarding uh, net new gaming vendors to our market uh, to bring into the G2S world as well as involved in our back-end central system. And as Mark indicated, um, I'm an executive board member with IGSA, serving in the capacity of secretary and treasurer. Excellent, thank you, Paul. Uh, and then lastly, but certainly not least, we have from the Western Canada Lottery Corporation, Mr. Eric Carmack, who's the VP of VLT Gaming and Operations. Hello, Eric. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm a 32-year uh, technology veteran. Uh, worked across a number of industries, um, finance, uh, technology, and uh, last but not least, gaming, of which uh, I've been uh, working for almost 15 years. Um, the vast majority, probably 14 and 13 years of those, have been with uh, the G, uh, GSA and with the G2S protocol. Um, I currently look after the video lottery division in Saskatchewan, where we have uh, 4,200 VLTs running across 570 retail locations and uh, happily purring on the G2S protocol. So. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, I think it, it's absolutely fantastic that uh, our three panelists come from different disciplines within the gaming industry. Uh, we've got compliance, we've got operations, we've got marketing, and, and I think that will really allow us to explore the value that the GSA game to system or G2S uh, standard will will provide um, um, operators. Um, I would like to start out with a specific question for each of the panelists, uh, and then we'll go through questions that are sort of open for anyone to answer. However, um, I'd like this to be as interactive as possible, so please feel free to add to the answer provided. Uh, so gentlemen, if you're ready, we'll kick the panel off with the first question going to Mr. Bennett. Uh, so Greg, um, 
can you share with us how the um, G2S standard helps operators comply with regulatory requirements as well as perhaps, you know, regulators verifying that compliance? Yeah, the biggest uh, benefit that, that, that we uh, found with going to the GSA protocols is our ability to download uh, information to the games. Download games, download OSs, download bill acceptors, uh, card readers, even uh, printers. And um, our, our, our jurisdiction is quite a, a large one by physical size. And we have technicians going out um, all over the place doing these upgrades. And, and it would take us several months to do these mm -hmm. upgrades. With the use of the protocol, um, I literally can change a game uh, once it's been gone through its regular, regulatory processes. I can change a game in a few hours in, in, in a few machines. It, uh, I can do a network in a few days. Um, this allows us to be a lot more uh, active in, in updating software, especially if, if something is found uh, as an anomaly or something's just not working right. Mm. In addition to that, what the system does allow is uh, allows a uh, program validation. So basically it, it, it does uh, check our software um, to make sure that it is what we put on it. And we have that done several times. Uh, so a logic door is open or a pop, the machine is powered off or just ad hoc, we're verifying the software is uh, a match to what the copy is in our central system. This is very much uh, uh, helpful in the fact that I don't have to send investigators or technicians to verify software. I can do it on the system and uh, be confident that what's on, uh, on the terminal is what is meant to be there. Uh, and and I, I would imagine that you're doing that, that authentication using the G2S version of GAT, correct? Correct. Uh, and, and then you, you mentioned something that I just want to make sure uh, I understand. When you said you're downloading software, and I think you, you mentioned an OS game theme, and also um, the firmware that goes to printers and to bill validators, you, you're doing that um, from a compliance perspective if, for example, a particular version is obsoleted or if there's something's being revoked and that way you know for a fact that what's running in those machines is is the latest uh, approved version of that of that software correct excellent um, I, I think that that's a really that's a really big value add uh, and and as you mentioned you know being distributed um, it, it even it even adds more value however if you've got a casino that has 1,000, 1,500 slot machines, being able to do exactly what you just described is, is of significant value um, as well. Um, so, so Paul, going over to you, if you don't mind, um, GSA often touts how its standards can um, improve an operator's marketing efforts. Um, can you share with us uh, your views on this? Number one, uh, do you agree? Uh, and if you do, um, perhaps could, could you share like one or two examples of how G2S practically helps in marketing efforts? Uh, absolutely. And yes, I, I do agree with that statement, Mark. Um, first thing that comes to mind for, for me is, you know, picking up on, uh, on Greg's comment of, of remote downloading. Mm -hmm. So uh, in our marketplace, we have uh, over... 6,000 VLTs and 1,000 sites across four different jurisdictions with four different sets of operating uh, regulatory frameworks. So for us to get a uh, product quickly in front of the player and uniquely is one of the key features uh, from a marketing perspective. So with the ability to, to remote download and with the ability to be able to um, sequence your games in the game chooser so taking a new new a new game theme uh identifying to the player that it's new we can put it in the number one uh spot in the top left cor corner we can also add you know an, uh, a a new game sash to that game icon which tells the player right away i mean typically when you look at anything from a player's perspective you go to the top left corner first and go 
left to right and then down. It's a really great opportunity to identify the players, especially in a distributed market, everything is a multi-game suite. So you want your, your new opportunities or the games you're trying to promote front and center, right? Uh, as well, there's a scheduling component that we take advantage of as well. So we can have a set of games that run during the daytime for players. And then when you get a different crowd come in the evening, we can use an automatic, automatic scheduler to switch those games over and that's all done uh, remotely. Um, and from other marketing, um, other marketing concepts uh, from the media class, I know Eric, I'll let you jump in here, that you're definitely with a specific situation taking advantage of that as well. Yes, absolutely. Uh, one really good example of being able to leverage the media display capabilities for us uh, over through the G2S protocol. Uh, has been being able to leverage the modern browser-based framework uh, to actually display uh, things like details of the wide area jackpot winners, details of new games, and other significant promotional information uh, without relying upon the services of a gaming or marketing vendor. In particular, the uh, most relevant case of that is COVID-19, where we've been able to immediately display instructions for social distancing and machine sanitization to the player community, much to the great relief of our regulators uh, in being able to address that particular concern. That, that, that's fantastic. Um, really cool use case there of, of the, the, the player user interface capabilities. Uh, Paul, if I might, going, going back to, you, to what you were touching on in terms of uh, downloading game themes and, and using a scheduler to, to uh, change them, um, the, the idea of network gaming and, and, and remote configuration and download, which I know people sometimes argue, well, you have to download a machine before you can configure it, but whatever. Um, it, that was tried uh, in, in North America several years ago, and especially in, in the US, uh, and even, even in some places in Europe, um, it, it sort of, at first was very exciting, and then it did not work. Um, I used to work for WMS Gaming, and, and actually was in charge of the remote gaming um, uh, system, we, we had a system that only worked with WMS games. The system that you're describing in use in, in your facility downloads and configures games across multiple manufacturers. Is that correct? That, that is correct. We currently have, you know, three major uh, gaming manufacturers on our network, um, each with eight to 12 games on a multi-game suite and everything works seamless. And, and can you download uh, game theme and OS or just uh, game themes? No, uh, game themes, OS, uh, as Greg had indicated, we're using the same system, uh, peripheral updates as, as we need to. So wow. if, you, you know, if you have to, to make a quick uh, uh, printer configuration change or if you have a new uh, uh, bill currency coming out, it's just a matter of pushing that OS down. That's great. Thank you very much. All right. Um, let's see. Actually, Eric, uh, I'll continue with you if you don't mind. Um, so, obviously, the, the Canadian gaming market is is unique in that, um, as as you all have been describing, the GSA standards usage is is far more prevalent, uh, and especially in the video lottery terminal operation side, as opposed to the casino operation side. So perhaps you could um, share some operational functions um, and, and their value that, that you guys as VLT operators can, can take advantage of, whereas your casino colleagues could not. I'm not trying to start a fight. I'm, I'm just trying to, 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 to understand maybe some of the functionalities that you guys can do that uh, per perhaps the, the, the casino guys would love to be able to do in the future. Absolutely. Well. Um... Obviously, in addition to the superior command and control and monitoring capabilities uh, of G2S, um, which you know compared to SAS is is uh, you know years ahead. Uh, one particular function reflecting what uh, Greg and Paul have already mentioned is stands out for us is that of downloadable gaming, um, you know, which includes peripherals, um, and machine OS firmware. With this ability, with this ability, we have been able to save literally millions of dollars in operational costs by avoiding necessary site visits across a large geographic footprint. And that's something that's obviously unique to video lottery 
um, but it's been extremely beneficial. Um, you know, our time to market for new games is immediate, and so is our ability to analyze performance in a very meaningful way with the extensive data that G2S is able to uh, offer. Um, you know, in recent years, we'd had the G2S uh, based uh, download, download gaming in a slot program, but it was poorly implemented and, and impractical to use. Um, and ultimately, we validate our assumption that G2S is a great protocol, but there has to be vendor buy-in for it to be uh, successfully implemented. You know, one of the things that uh, VLT programs have, uh, which is unique perhaps to the industry, is we were able to do like a, take a greenfield approach where we uh, deploy the entire network all at once. Uh, and so we were able to uh, leverage economies of scale and also get vendors in the room together to collaborate on how to actually efficiently um, manage to deploy downloadable gaming capabilities. Um, and I don't think I'm telling tales at a school that one particular vendor I know for a fact used uh, Saskatchewan uh, as their test bed to uh, refine the download, downloadable gaming for the benefit of their slot product. So, uh, you know, there's a great case where there can be, um, you know, cross uh, line of business collaboration and benefit. And and in essence, uh, if, if I understand what you said, they were uh, sort of honing their skills, making sure that, that the downloading um, uh, capabilities were in, at a point where they were practically usable and then and then could bring it to other markets. That's exactly right. I mean, obviously, it was a concept, uh, you know, back in 2008, 2009. And, you know, we saw lots of demonstrations at uh, G2E of uh, proof of concept, but it was never really, it was more of a fad that was talked about versus something that was practical to implement on a large scale um, because we were dealing with thousands of machines across a wide area network. We had a very, very valuable uh, use case mm -hmm. uh, in terms of cost savings. Um, so, uh, you know, I think all of us in the operator community, customer community, were, were very much behind uh, encouraging vendors to develop that uh, properly and, and finalize that product. Um, what I think happened as a result is the VLT central systems have a fantastic kind of gaming capability, but that's yet to be implemented on the slot side. It's really, I think, a case of, you know, customer demand has to be there for that same technology capability to be deployed in that, in that market. And it certainly by exists. But by customer, do you mean the operators or players? Uh, the, the operators, the yeah. operators, you know, I, I think that one of the challenges, one of, I guess, the differences in the casino is it's easy to dispatch a field technician on the floor uh, to quickly uh, deploy software. Um, so, you know, why do it? But if you actually look at the bigger picture and say you have a casino property of, you know, 10,000 machines, suddenly you can start seeing economies of scale um, that build a business case to demand that feature uh, and then obviously drive vendors to deploy it. Hopefully. Well, and 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 not 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 to harp on on something that is you know pr pretty um, top of mind right now and and is in the news media, but you mentioned COVID nineteen earlier. Uh, I think one one of the things that we we all need to be sort of aware of is you know as we as we reopen casinos, we, we need to make sure that we're not only protecting our patrons but we're also protecting our staff. And if there's a way that we can use technology to eliminate some of the you know manual touch points that might expose people to all kinds of stuff. I mean, you know, I think there's some, some other value that could be sort of derived from, from some of these technologies. Uh, I do want to touch one more on one more point that you made, Eric. Um, and that is, I think you said that you're able to analyze slot machine performance in a way that you could not before because of the data that you're pulling from slot machines. Did I understand that correctly? It's more about the yeah the the information that uh, machine behavior. There's there's a volume of information in, G, in G2S that just isn't available in SAS. Um, you know, it, it is a a larger protocol, um, but there's a huge amount of information that can be harvested from it. And we're really only just starting to scratch the surface of the capability in the G2S space. But I think the capability is probably being exhausted in the SAS space just because of the age of that protocol. Got it. Thank you. Um... So, so one of the other things that I'll, I'll, I'll open up as a, a question to, to all the panelists is, uh, I'm sure you, you, you sort of heard this a long time ago when you, when you first started uh, down the G2S path, especially since it's been you know, 10 some years now uh, that you all have been working on this. Um, and that is that the comment that G2S is too big, it, it's too difficult, it's too expensive to implement. Uh, so, so based on your experience with both, I guess, implementing and using G2S, would you agree or disagree with some of those statements? And I'll, and I'll throw it out to you guys, whoever wants to answer. 
that was certainly our concern 10 years ago uh, when we were considering the G2S based network. Um, but now, as I said, we we have over 570 sites uh, running 4,200 terminals, and we're just the smallest network. You know, ALC, MBLL, HLC, they have over, you know, six and a half thousand terminals. Quebec has 10,000 terminals running. Um, you know, in addition to vendors using data compression to reduce the size of data transmissions, uh, network and storage capacity has increased many fold. Um, to such an extent that G2S size and complexity never forms mm. part of a capacity related discussion anymore. Uh, in fact, the sophistication of the protocol has allowed us uh, rapid development of features such as a wide area progressive capability oh. across uh, disparate vendors faster than it likely occurred in the days of SaaS because it is an open published protocol uh, with no risk of vendor lock in or uh, you know, proprietary leveraging. Uh, in addition to these considerations, there are suppliers such as Comtrait. Uh, who make readily built software stacks to allow vendors to rapidly implement G2S. So there's no longer a barrier to their entry into our market, especially. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point, right? That uh, Comtrade also is a, uh, is a GSA member and, and they, they do build a, a G2S stack both for the system side as well as for the, the game side. And I know a number of companies that have actually um, purchased or licensed that stack and, and are using it as a, as a way to rapidly, you know, ramp up their, their G2S uh, product offering. So it's a, that's a really good point. Um, anybody else want to add anything? I, I think that any time a protocol is developed, you're always going to have your your growing pains. Mm. And, and when we first started, we did have some issues. Um, but I think that, uh, as to Eric, the, the technology has, has moved quite a bit and has really settled into its groove. Um, you know, we're all running this protocol um, and very few times do you run into an issue and you get all this extra um, uh, support from, from your games, the ability to download. I, I think that um, when you first get into it, uh, there is a learning curve. However, um, jurisdictions like us have, have really kind of pushed that learning curve uh, away and you can benefit from from our uh, knowledge and, and and the vendors some of the major vendors uh, are the same vendors that are doing the slot equipment are very good at uh, designing a, a protocol that will work with their machines um, uh, we we get machines all the time now new and there's a lot less development in getting these things to work than there was in, the, in you know, the early uh, 2000s. That, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, and, you know, I mean, the G2S has been around for, for quite a while. Um, SAS has been around, you know, for, for much longer. So uh, I think j just as it, with any new thing, right, the vendors themselves had to sort of get acclimated to and develop the, the expertise uh, with the standard, but to your point, they've been doing this now for for upwards of a decade, and uh, now they've gotten really good at it. Um, which which I guess leads me to another point. I mean, you, you guys have mentioned three vendors, right? So uh, one of the other things that we hear is, well, nobody's implemented G2S, or you know, there's only you know one or maybe two suppliers of gaming devices that that have actually implemented G2S. So what I'm hearing from you guys is that is not really the, the case, correct? Uh, I'll jump in here. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. Um, you know, across Canada, we all have, for the most part, the three major North American gaming vendors in our programs, but we also have uh, many more looking to, to join in. Um, and the issue is never really around the effort around developing to G2S. The, the issue is always around uh, market capacity, how many terminals can they buy in for, what, how much R&D effort do they need to put in as a market entry point, and then what's their, what's their return? So, and that, that's typically because from a game development perspective, the backend protocol is, is, is universal. The, the game dev side is, is unique to every jurisdiction mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we all have different min, bet, max, bet, top wards, RTPs. So they, they have to do a unique game set. But from a development perspective and, and the availability now of tool sets such as Red Blue, 
getting your basic cabinet up and running command control is not as difficult as, as some may think it is. Great, thank you. Somebody else wanted to say something, sorry? Yeah, I was gonna say in our experience, most of the major players have already implemented a variant of G2S. Uh, for example, IGT, Scientific Games, Aristocrat, Nevermatic, and even Konami. Mm -hmm. uh, but the level of implementation has been proportional to customer demand. Uh, in this regard, the central system or CMS is key. You know, I think customers really need to truly understand the longer term benefits of G2S so that they can demand it, uh, that it forms part of their longer term gaming technology strategy. Uh, and, and, and actually, Eric, that, that's, a, that's a good point, right? That G2S is, is a big protocol. Uh, I mean, I think that the, the last time I, I looked at the spec, it was like over 3,000 pages long. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't make it you know, more difficult to implement. It just says it's got a lot of functionality. And as you all know, G2S is broken down into what we call classes. So, so the, the number of classes that you implement really are market driven. I mean, there's a, there's a core set of classes. There are six of them which are required in order for a slot machine or a VLT or an EGD, call it whatever you want, um, to be able to communicate to a, to a backend system uh, or to any system. Uh, but beyond that, then there's a whole bunch of, you know, I'll call them optional classes that you implement only if the market demands them. So uh, I think that's, that's the point that, that you're, you're trying to make there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so moving on. Um, Another question that, that I thought would, would be interesting to address is um, we've also, as GSA, been saying that G2S can help not only reduce costs, but also increase revenues. I think, Eric, you said that, you know, it has saved, G2S has saved you millions of, of operational dollars in terms of having to deal with employees going, you know, across the, the, the various locations to, to do work. But, but given your experience, can, can you perhaps quantify um, the, the, the um, real monetary value claim? Is, is, that, is that something that's occurring? Uh, let me start. Um, two different perspectives from, a, from an OPEX perspective, you know, given, as I had mentioned earlier, you know, a, a thousand sites over uh, four different uh, provincial jurisdictions. In the old days, when you had to visit each machine, uh, to put out new product to generate revenue, you had that initial OPEX cost that you had to recoup um, as well when it took, you know, four to six months to get a new game generating revenue, your ROI took much longer. Now with remote downloading, um, as Greg had indicated earlier, you can, you can push a game down to your entire network in days. Therefore you're generating revenue instantly. So, you're saving, you're saving on, on your OPEX overhead, but mm -hmm. you're also bringing in that incremental revenue a lot faster. Yeah, I, I think reflecting that, uh, come the speed of product to market with the G2S platform has been greatly improved. Um, you know, we've had cases where we put games in the field and the vendor said, yeah, you know, we think the players don't like this particular feature. Let's just tweak that and redeploy it and boom, you know, as long as we can get it through GLI, uh, you know, we can have an updated game in a matter of a few weeks that would have taken many, many months uh, in a traditional uh, prom type of uh, replacement program that, uh, from yesteryear. Um, as well, we've been able to improve player engagement through the application of G2S based media display capabilities. Um, also, the ability to trace and diagnose issues have greatly improved, which naturally reduces operational costs and mm -hmm. potential risk of uh, lost revenues. You know, we've been able to get everybody together in a room. Everybody understands the protocol. Uh, as long as the techies are allowed to communicate with one another, it's very, very easy uh, to, to quickly eliminate uh, any pinch points that are, are potentially ultimately cost you revenue. Uh, similarly, we, we've had issues where, where a game had a malfunction and literally turned it around in a week or so, updated in our, our machines. And uh, this was one of our top games several years ago and we could not stand to have this one down for any length of time. So we were able to get it up and running, fixed, tested, and uh, back in the customer's hands. The other thing that I think that people don't realize as much, it actually creates the game, or, or at least in Alberta, the game staff that pick and choose what, what type of games, they tend to be a little more creative because it doesn't take six months 
after the game is developed to get it in the field to find out it doesn't work. If it, when you've got this ability to put something in, you put it in as a trial. Uh, you can try it at different, uh, you know, different sites. I mean, uh, although we have 800 current sites, they're, they're in different locations and they're very different uh, patrons that go there. Some are in casinos, some are in uh, what we call games room, um, and some are in the local bar. So you may not put the same uh, game set in there because it's a different crowd. And our, our gaming staff have, have been moving up the bets and uh, trying things that, that in the past would not have happened because we were always so worried about protecting revenue. And with the ability to move things around, um, you actually have that uh, ability to try new things and, and, and you know, some work, some don't but at least you had the ability to try and then you can kind of market to certain players where you couldn't before. You just kind of had to put it to everyone. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, Greg. Um, going back, Eric, to something that you, you touched on, which was the media display, right? Which is again, that player user interface or some people refer to it as picture in picture. Um, have, you, have you been developing um, or have you thought of developing some responsible gaming or or um, player protection um, capabilities to, to display in in that in that window? Yeah, so we actually do have a product uh, from our central system vendor um, that is built on that same web framework. So uh, in our case, it's the Intelligent Central System um, has the uh, I think it's called PSM Player Services Module. Um, I think ALC has a similar. Uh, capabilities so the players are able to see their spend and uh, you know be aware uh, and self-manage their their play uh, play behavior so yes it's already it's already in place and and it's it's working very well um, and, and it could be extended further if we wanted to uh, I'm sure it will be in due, in due time uh, and, and then w one other question uh, I, I think it goes back to, to something that you touched on Paul uh, which is um, what, why, why do you think um, that there is this this perception that um, slot manufacturers can't, you know, get into the, these uh, G2S markets or specifically the Canadian market? Is it because the VLT market is is small? Is it because of the replacement cycle? What, what, what do you think those those barriers might be? Well, when 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 G2S first hit the market. Um, I thought the original concept was going to be for, you know, large casino floors because of all of the features and benefits uh, that that were were available. Uh, so I think, you know, what you really need to do is you need to look at your internal processes and say, specifically, what are we, what are we trying to improve in our, in our organization or, or on our casino floors and what what uh, what classes within G2S, as you mentioned, Mark, there's multiple classes. Which ones of those could we take advantage of to provide a better player experience to our patrons and as well look at from an operational efficiency of our organization to try to get product to our players in a more efficient manner? Okay, that, that makes sense. Uh, and, and, then, and then, Greg, something that, that you said sort of resonated with me when when you were talking about you know the ability to 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 change stuff if there's an if there's a uh, at WMS we were famous for having an anomaly in our code that's a, that's a long time ago um, but um, th th this idea of being able to um, very quickly put something discover there's a problem you know get it fixed get it get it retested get it approved and then deployed uh, I mean you know th there are jurisdictions out there that. Um, even outside of the U.S., where if an operator wants to even move a machine or or change a game theme, those games are dark for days, weeks, in some cases even months, because they're using you know tamper-proof tape, and they have to use they have to send an agent, uh, a regulatory agent, to be there to, to oversee the, you know, the 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 RAM clear and the and the installation of the new uh, game media and making sure that it's uh, set according to the jurisdictional requirements. I mean, what, what you described 
not only is it a labor savings for for the regulators because you know they don't need to send agents to all these places but really it's a it's a huge benefit for the operators in terms of minimizing risk and i think you mentioned that right it really reduces the risk of being of running bad software wrong software what have you but also it, it 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 could potentially increase revenue because now you you moved the machine you converted a machine you've done all that stuff and you've done it much more frequently did i understand that correctly correct a couple of things if you put the wrong software in a machine if it happens to come from the 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 warehouse or wherever with the wrong software gat won't let it come up at all, um, it will fail. But our, our, our VLTs in Alberta are still sealed, just like a normal unit. And because you can download it and verify it with the system, the seals do not get broken. Um, so the only time really you're, you're breaking seals is if you're replacing logic boards. Mm-hmm. And then as you guys know, the, the, the hardware in, now is much better than what it was years ago. Um, so, so we very rarely have issues of where we've had to send someone out to take, uh, you know, version numbers and so on and so forth. So uh, our regulators don't need to go, or technicians don't need to go to the field just to check those things. We can actually pull it from the system and verify that it works. Verify this correct version. That, that's really good information. It's good, it's, it's good, good info to have there. Um, uh, I'm thinking of another question. Um, so obviously, G2S is implemented across the VLT side. And, and as I mentioned earlier, again, not trying to pick a fight, but in Canada, for, for whatever reason or reasons, uh, and probably very valid ones, the casino side has not implemented yet. But it, it, since you guys have gone through it and now have been using G2S for a decade, what advice would you have for other operators who may not know how to start down a path of, you know, adopting G2S or maybe are sitting there going, oh my God, this is an, an all or nothing kind of thing or how much money is this going to cost me? I, I'm not going to worry about it. Anybody? What are the benefits that that video lottery had at least um, a few years ago was we literally forklifted in a new system and new VLT. So it made it very easy. Um, One of the problems, if you have a site, you know, with 1500 slot machines, it is difficult to, to, you know, uh, to retrofit some of the older stuff. Um, But there is some, some real value in, even looking at a hybrid system or uh, a multiple system and move things over. I think, you know, as replacement cycles go, there's a lot more equipment that is G2S capable than what there was uh, a few years ago. And I think that's, that's the way to do it. Um, and will help things move along. Uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to, you know, if you have 15,000 machines, to change all the machines out, but if you if you did a hybrid floor, I think you'd soon learn that the, the G2S is very helpful. It is giving you the information that when we do buy new machines, we want to put them on the new system, not the old. Yeah, I, I think also reflecting that you know it, it has to be part of a unified long-term technology strategy strategy where an organization's technology and executive community. Uh, need to understand and embrace the benefits of the G2S platform, you know, particularly its openness. Uh, you know, G2S is now where HTML was, I think, uh, 30 years ago. Mm. You know, some may argue that protocols don't make money, and, and these are typically the same folks that once thought the internet was a fad, I think. Um, yet here we are now with the world transacting trillions of dollars on the internet. Um, so, you know, in our VLT program, we only leverage a very small subset of G2S capabilities and have seen significant benefits. I personally really look forward to the day that I see a large casino property truly implemented to its full extent, as I personally believe it, with the right resources and mindset, it could blow the doors off of the, the competition through you know, using best of breed solutions um, and the efficiencies that would be offered from that openness uh, that's built right in. So, so to, to, that, to that point, Eric, the, the, the concept of, of best of breed and, and the openness of, of G2S, 
have, have any of you uh, in your organizations considered developing your own software or, or um, partnering with other software providers, given the fact that you know, G2S allows multiple hosts to be connected or multiple systems to be connected to, could the slot machines maybe a, a separate analytical um, tool or, or some, some other you know, software to do uh, maybe better beverage service or something like that? I think all of us have our own little discrete activities. Um, you know, any of us with a technology background uh, see the tantalizing benefits that are available in being able to connect that stream stream of information. Um, you know, it does take some collaboration with gaming vendors because we don't want to start hanging off weird exotic pieces of hardware that uh, could risk uh, the integrity of uh, the environment. Um, but for sure, I know in our shop we have some interesting discussions about uh, some concepts we'd like to uh, you know look at within the next five years for sure. Paul, were you going to say something? Sorry, the, the box moved. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, Mark. You know, jumping jumping back to the, you know, how how do you how do you implement it on a, on a casino floor? The other, you know, thing to take into consideration is, is you can't just look at comparing the cost of a CMS to a G2S system, because G2S can do more than just command and control. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at your overall, you know, floor cost because you can have player tracking built into your G2S system. So you'd have to take all your different floor modules, look at that overall picture. And, you know, to Eric's point, it has to be part of your overall technology and strategy path going mm. forward. So that would be the recommendation as well is that, is that have a look at your entire infrastructure and say, where do I want to go and what's the best way to get there? Excellent. And, and then um, sort of going back to, to, to COVID-19 and, and the, the, the concept of um, communications that you teed up, Eric, um, is, there, is there anything else that you guys are doing leveraging G2S uh, in, in ways that could, um, as, as I might have uh, alluded to, maybe reduce employee contact with gaming devices? I think that speaks again to the point mentioned earlier that, you know, an example was through our planned implementation of social distancing. Uh, you know, we need to be certain that various machines are disabled. Mm. Um, the sophistication of G2S really allows us to know the machine's true state, uh, which is something we were never able to accurately ascertain uh, under the, our SaaS platform uh, previously. You know, SaaS was designed with the mindset that slot machines stay on 24 seven. I remember when we were helping uh, build the, the G2S capabilities with the vendors, they're like, why would you have hours of operation for an EGM? That doesn't make any sense. You know, why, don't you have your casinos open 24 hours a day? And, you know, the strip, that's absolutely correct. But in a government gaming program in Canada, we have to have very heavily enforced hours of operation. And we have to be able to ascertain without question that those machines are inactive uh, to, to obey prevailing legislation and policy. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a capability that was only available with G2S uh, to a sufficient degree of accuracy. And the regulator. Oh, sorry. sorry, Greg. Go ahead. The, the regulator too um, has the control to turn which machines on or off. You know, the, in the SaaS world, you could turn off uh, communication and the machine would come back up. Right. Um, you can't do that on a VLT. It does need that communication, and it will not come up. So when you host disable that device because of COVID nineteen, the expectation it's off and. Uh, you know, the only way to turn it back on is, is through through the system and reconfiguring it to be on. And you as the regulator know that it's truly off. You're not, you're not guessing that the operator has, you know, really turned it off, you, you, you know, for yeah. a fact. Uh, and going back to what you said, Eric, about, you know, uh, ca casinos in the Strip in Vegas are 24-7. Uh, I've been working in Europe for two and a half, going on three years now, and I work with the online uh, gaming side of the business and with the land-based uh, side of the business. And the vast majority of uh, regulated jurisdictions in Europe have uh, parlors, shops, mm -hmm. have, you know, casinos that are not 24-7. And, and many of them, in order to comply, physically, you know, press the off switch to turn them off. They don't rely on SAS because they, the regulators know that SAS is not reliable from that perspective. Now, uh, you, you can imagine... Um, 
that given given what's going on with with this pandemic and given that casinos have shut down in many jurisdictions around the world some operators have actually said we're going to leave the slot machines on even though we're shutting the front doors because we're afraid if we power down these games they might not come back up now imagine these these you know various locations in europe much like you're describing where on a daily basis they power off and power on you know as as machines get old yes to, to greg's point the hardware the PCB boards, they are getting better, but they're still pieces of electronic. So, and, and every once in a while, something blows up. So to, to, have, to have a protocol that can, can absolutely make sure that a gaming device is not playable and can, and can show the regulator that it's not playable, I think there's, there's a, a benefit there that you know, um, most people don't even think about from a protocol perspective, because th to your point, it's a protocol who, who really cares right well i think it's it's also the elegance of the protocol that's often lost uh with g2s that those three thousand pages contain uh, one of the directives I, I remember seeing you know the vl or the vgm must disable unless these certain conditions are met um you know sas i don't think it's that explicit it's on or it's off but if the machine doesn't get it well okay still keep running to greg's point um, the protocol is embedded in the operating system of, of the machine. There's no debates. And if the, if the vendor says, well, we're going to charge you to fix that. Well, no, the, the protocol that everybody in the industry agrees to says you must abide by that direction. So it makes it much, much easier uh, to, to explicitly um, control those machines. And Great point. Mark, the, um, the central system that the three of us are using, the IGT Intelligent, uh, via the local site controller, also gives the frontline or bar staff the ability mm -hmm. to do a temporary local disable. So if you take the, you know, the current world we're in now, they can, through that site controller, be notified that there's a cash out. So they can, if they choose, they can do a temporary disable, uh, go to that machine, do a, do a, a sanitary clean down uh, for the next player or patron coming uh, to that machine, go back to their site controller and do a quick re-enable and all within the control of that one person. Uh, and, and actually, I'm, I'm glad you, you um, brought that point up, Paul. Um, a while ago, we had a, a conversation uh, with an operator on the strip that, that uses G2S and uh, they shared with us a homegrown application that they basically developed that allowed, allowed a, you know, appropriately um, approved employees, these were manage, manager level employees, to, to actually be able to essentially reset a machine using a mobile phone app that they created. So, so the idea of, hey, there's a problem with a machine and now I have to go physically in front of it to do something, they actually even eliminated that and, and made it so that you know, machines being down was a, a, a very short lived sort of scenario. So again, they did that through through the power of G two S, the the openness that Eric you mentioned, it and the ability to to leverage it for you know a variety of, of different um, scenarios. Um, so so we, we're we're getting close to to ten minutes before our hour is up. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, one one more question, and and that is, you know, uh, G GSA has been has been around for over twenty two years. We've developed a number of standards. Uh, many of them have been implemented around the world, um, but but we all always are, are challenging ourselves to understand how can we do things better. Uh, and one of the questions we ask is how can gaming vendors or how can we further support the advancement of G2S in the industry? And I was wonder uh, wondering as as three three entities that have you know deployed G2S obviously are enjoying the benefits obviously can very clearly and easily articulate what those benefits are. C can you share some advice on, on what vendors can do and what we can do better? Anybody? Yeah, I can start there. Um, and it's, an, it's a recent um, news example as well. So we, we, you know, we spent the last you know, 50 minutes talking about two different gaming environments of so distributed market and casino floors and um, vendors have Two different, two different central systems, if you will, for those environments. But recently in Sweden, because um, Sweden and their video lottery distributed network wanted to go 100% cashless. That's 
where they wanted their, their industry to go. And IGT was able to uh, use the current intelligence system that the three of us are using and integrate in from their casino side, their advantage cashless system into the G2S intelligence system. And I think, you know, the ability to look at within their business units, those verticals and, and, and integrate in is, gives me the sense that there's even further opportunity that, you know, I'd like personally like to see the vendors look at how do I take the best of everything I have and, and cross pollinate um, gaming environments. And, and, and I think Paul, to, to that point also, um, g given the environment that we're in today, where touching stuff is becoming a little um, <laughs> less, less of a pleasurable thing, mm -hmm. uh, people will say, you know, cash is really germy. Uh, how can we eliminate handling cash? I think the idea of using a cashless solution uh, I think I, I saw in one of the industry um, uh, publications that Scientific Games also has introduced uh, a number of you know contactless or cashless capabilities. Th th this, these are things that that can be done quite easily using G2S, and again, address ad address real real issues. Uh, Eric, I saw you were going to answer something. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was uh, just saying, uh, just say that uh, you know gaming vendors, uh, in my view, need to continue their support uh, as long as they have been doing as happening on the EGM side. Uh, and in addition, work harder to be more, more of a partner than just a provider on the uh, CMS central system side. Um, you know, in addition, the GSA may want to consider ways to engage the technology community at large to educate them of the benefits of G2S uh, from a more holistic technology perspective. Uh, for example, perhaps host competitions for the best ideas on potential use cases. You know, maybe an example would be building a cost-efficient bridge between an interactive and brick-and-mortar environment, leveraging, you know, web services capabilities. Um, you know, I, I think the next big step in G2S evolution won't come from uh, incumbent methods. It will only really come from people thinking big picture and truly wanting and being capable of implementing best-of-breed solutions for many disparate vendors. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very interesting comment, the, the idea of building a bridge between the the interactive and, and brick and mortar. Um, so I, I've been spending a lot of time dealing with um, issues on the on the um, online side. Uh, and, and actually, this is not what this webinar is about. But we have GSA is developing a a standard that does in fact bridge online with with brick and mortar, and that's our regulatory reporting interface. Uh, for reporting data uh, to to regulators from suppliers, from operators, from systems, be they online, be they land based, or be they even lottery. Uh, so, so, so we are we are, as a matter of fact, thinking about how to how to build those bridges, uh, not not using G two S, but but it, that's a very interesting comment, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, one of the other things that you said that that resonates with me is. Um, dealing with the technologists. Uh, and, and one of the challenges that we have as an industry uh, is that, you know, we think, we think of the, the, the larger casinos. Um, there, are, there are people that have, you know, a CIO title. There are people that have a CTO title. There are people that have operational titles. And, and then you've got, the, you know, the chief executive. Um, the, the slot floor has typically been in the domain of the slot operators. Uh, and I think there's there's more of a working relationship with IT today than there used to be. But but by and large, when we reach out to the technologists and say, we'd like to talk to you about the slot protocol, they look at us and say, go talk to the slot guys. When we talk to the slot guys and we say, we want to talk to you about the slot protocol, they're interested in, well, is it is it going to make me more money? And your examples today clearly have shown how G2S could generate additional revenues but really what they're focused on is maximizing the revenue of that casino floor and truly what they're focused on when you go one layer lower is which game themes are going to resonate with my customer base and it's going to generate more you know revenue per square footage uh, so so when you start talking about technology it, it, it's sort of it's difficult to get everybody in in the same room uh, and, and that's something which, which obviously um, we, we need to improve on. But, but thank you for, for raising that because that's a, that's a, a, a real issue. 
Um, we, we, we did have one, one question that we have not addressed as we've gone through this. Uh, and that is, um, so Greg, I think, and, and, and the rest of the panelists, you, you all mentioned downloading um, software to build validators and printers to peripheral devices. Not every peripheral device can be downloaded to correctly. I mean, there is, there is a cost to replacing that hardware. Is that correct? Absolutely. All of, hardware is. all of our VLTs were, were built to support downloadable. So some of the older equipment um, and slot floors may not be, but if they have anything in the last 10 years, um, there is usually a secondary port that you can download on to. So I, I think with some work, I think you could have <clears throat> just about anything downloadable. So, so, so there, must, there might be some, some investigation in terms of doing a, a survey of the equipment that you've got, the age of that equipment, whether, whether it could be a matter of a firmware upgrade, or in some cases it might very well be that the peripheral device itself has to be replaced because it does not support the new firmware or does not have, to your point, Greg, a secondary port on it. All right. Um, I, I think that that is, that is all the time that we have. We're, we're running up to the, uh, to the three minute mark before the, uh, the end of the session. Uh, gentlemen, I, I really do want to thank you again for participating in, in this first ever um, IGSA webinar. Uh, I appreciate your time and, and the information obviously that you've shared with us. Um, to our audience, I'd like to thank you as well. Um, thank you for your participation and thank you for all the questions that you've submitted. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this webinar will be available to, to view. Uh, again, click on that YouTube icon at the bottom right of our website, which is igsa.org. Uh, if you have any additional questions or if you've got comments on how we can make these sessions more informative or if you've got a topic that you'd like us to, to cover, please feel free to contact us. Uh, again, information on how to do that uh, is also uh, found on our website page. Uh, and, and with that, unless there's uh, anything else, I want to thank you all very, very much. And gentlemen, thank you again for your time today.